So welcome and good morning to everyone. My name is Michael Kennelly. I'm a practicing urologist from Charlotte, North Carolina in the United States. And as we've touched upon, one of the key areas when we're dealing with patients who have neurogenic bladder with intermittent catheterization is urinary tract infection. As was stated before, 2.7 times a year, patients have UTIs. Now there's many factors that go along with that. And what we want to do during this session is with some of my colleagues is kind of have an open discussion dialogue. And when we do that, we're actually going to involve you. So we're going to bring you in, and there'll be times where we're going to poll and ask questions, and we'll get to that. But I think the key aspect is, remember, we're here to try to improve the patient's lives. Over the last year, myself and my colleagues on the table with the assistance of Coloplast and some of our other colleagues have been working on a risk factor model, specifically what some of the risk factors are. And sort of the fruit of that labor has been the actual sort of manuscript that has been published in Advances in Urology. And really what we spent time on looking was really to get a review on the risk factors. So a question that I would probably pose again to the audience is, and this is where the voting card comes back, is really when you have patients dealing with intermittent catheterization, what is your sort of biggest challenge? And that would be orange is for trauma, blue is urinary tract infections, and green is UTIs. If you could sort of vote with that, what is, do you see as the most challenge for the IC user? So we're seeing a lot of blues, a lot of blues, a few greens, but overwhelmingly, I would say Close. still, you know, 90% urinary tract infections. And Nikesh, in, in your practice, is that predominantly when they're Absolutely. I mean, a lot of these patients are very active. They're young, they're mobile, they want to work and contribute to society. And when they get a urinary infection, tract infection, it can really knock them out, put them out for quite a few days, and they, they hate them. So yes, if, they could, if we can do anything to improve that aspect of their life, it would be great. Uh, so the, the next question that we would ask you, and Babas, do you want to? Yes. yes, if people, they think that they have a UTI, what is the most common uh, complaint that they think as a sign of UTI? Uh, you can vote if there are cloudy urine, fever, or maybe a new onset of incontinence. Okay, let's vote. All right, the majority, the majority maybe is cloudy urine, but also a lot of greens uh, and new onset of incontinence. So we do not have a clear answer, and the truth is that we do not have a clear answer because there is not a clear answer. There are a lot of signs and symptoms that we have to combine in order uh, to be sure. What's I think it's opinion? very interesting. You know, fever, there were very few blues that were out there. And when patients present with fever, a lot of times they look sick along that aspect. But it is probably true in my practice, majority, it's going to be the, the cloudy urine, the odor, sediment, something's not right. New onset incontinence oftentimes comes along with that. So very similar to your practices. I totally agree with you. That's why we have a patient came to your office and he or she present with numerous things such as, first of all, cloudy urine or odor. What is your present practice? What you would do and what kind of investigation you order in order to confirm, is it urinary tract infections or not? And selection right now on the screen, as you see, you will order urinary culture, which will take about 72 hours. You will do urine analysis with deep stick, which will give you immediate some response, or you will do complete blood counts, CBC. Any suggestions? Okay, I see a lot of orange, orange and green together, everything together, perfect. <laughs> that's, that's what there is, it looks like variety of options, variety of options and opinions. That's why in Canada, typically in the office, we immediately will do urine dipstick, which has deeper, depending what the capacity of dipstick will show as the presence of nitrates, presence of white blood cell counts, and so on. 
I will order typically CBC if I really concern patient has urosepsis or generalized infections, but it will be my last choice. And obviously, urine culture is a common and important additional aspects of diagnosis, final diagnosis, because we want to know what kind of bug person has, and then, of course, we want to know sensitivity. Michael. Yes, and I think the other question that we'd like to kind of address is, how do you actually define a urinary tract infection? And here, this is sort of also very hotly debated. You know, if we vote again, do you define it with an orange of symptoms only? Or is it positive urine culture only with blue? Or is it a combination green, symptoms and positive urinalysis? Overwhelming green. Very, very interesting. And I think that that's over the years we've kind of seen that, is that symptoms are usually the driver, but you want to get some backup objective information. One of the things that it's been noted on some of the guidelines, and we're going to get to those, is that you've got to have at least pyuria. If a patient comes in that doesn't have pyuria, that's really questioning, do they have a true infection? It may be something else that's going on. Pyuria alone doesn't drive an infection, but they must have that additionally with some of the symptoms. But let's kind of go through, and Nikesh, if you can speak to really kind of what the guidelines have shown, because it is confusing depending on what part of the world that you're in. Thank you, Michael. So it is a difficult topic. We do know that patients who have a catheter indwelling, or those that self-catheterize, often will have a positive urine dipstick, just by the fact that they're self-catheterizing. So it's very difficult for us to write guidelines or make statements to say, yes, they've definitely got a urine infection. And that's why most of you and us would also go with symptoms. Now, the guidelines are guidelines. They're guidelines to guide your practice. They're not set in stone. So you also have to use your clinical judgment, your clinical experience. Now, this field is quite difficult because we tend to focus guidelines on evidence base. I sit on one of the EAU guidelines, and apart from nice hotels and nice dinners, it's actually very hard work. There's, we go through all the, the papers from the previous year, to, you know, we access their quality, and then try and infer new guidelines every year. And you try and base it on evidence, but if there is no evidence, you have to have a consensus, an expert opinion, an expert panel, and come up with these guidelines to help guide treatment. So with the EAU guidelines for neurourology, they suggest that a urinary tract infection, the patient should have signs and symptoms, as we talked about, but also laboratory findings of a UTI. That is, they've got bacteria and pyura, white cells, and a positive urine culture. Now, the debate is, what is a positive urine culture? And the, the EAU have actually gone back and suggested, actually, 10 to the 2 is reasonable colony-forming units. Your countries will vary, your microbiologists will vary in what they consider is a positive urine culture. And sometimes in the UK, it's quite difficult because they will only report on 10 to the 5. And you're convinced the patient has an infection, but the lab will keep coming back and saying no culture. Because if it's less than 10 to the 5, they won't report it. Where the EAU say, actually, 10 to the 2 is reasonable if they're catheterizing. Suggest 10 to the 4 if it's a clean voided specimen. Of course, we should also focus on symptoms and signs. And the EAU suggests those with neurological disorders, those with urinary tract infections, should have a fever, a new onset incontinence, increased spasticity, malaise. They're very nonspecific symptoms that often patients complain about. Uh, also, cloudy urine that we've talked about, discomfort or pain in the kidney area, and dysuria or autonomic dysreflexia. Of course, they don't have to have all these symptoms, but a combination, one or two, all helps guide clinical practice. There are other guidelines. This is slightly dated now, but from the Infectious Disease Society of America, they also suggest signs and symptoms are compatible with a urinary tract infection, and they refer to 10 to the 3 of colony-forming units on their urine culture. Again, a different, a different level. Thank you, Mike. And then we have ISCOS, the International Spinal Cord Society, have also have a, a great data set, and they've looked at their data, and they again talk about new onset symptoms, and often the patients will tell you what they are, accompanied by laboratory findings, white cells, bacteria, and a positive urine culture. So you can see most of these based on urine culture. 
And they, again, their symptoms are very similar that we, we mentioned earlier. And they talk about a clean catch midstream technique for immediately installed catheter and any positive culture for the 10 to the 3. So you can see the guidelines are variable. It's difficult because the evidence base isn't great. So the consensus is what drives it. But I think most of us, you'd agree, would focus on symptoms and signs as well as something in their urine. And I think that's kind of the, the challenges, is that guidelines are very good, but they've got to be updated. They've got to be current. And as you can see here, some are in 2009. Other ones are updated. Andre, in Canada, what guidelines do you actually go by? Or do you even use the guidelines? This is an interesting question. First of all, as you know, majority of us, how often you will go and search PubMed, what is the latest in publications? We're all busy clinicians sometimes, and we believe that we're up to date with our knowledge. But sometimes we do know it's not happening. That's why many of the clinicians still believe that 2009 was the latest guidelines. It's reality. But we are progressing very quickly. And that's why it's a very important, actually, to do self-checks periodically. Like, for example, this symposium is fantastic venues to show where we are right now standing with guidelines. That's why we're trying to be up to date. That's the latest guidelines. This is what driving a diagnosis and criteria for management of the bladder. And I think it's, it's part of sort of globalization. As we as providers get together from all over the world, the onus is really upon us to kind of drive change, to actually have the ability to come up with consensus throughout. We use our societies to kind of be that body for us. But I think ultimately, you know, we have to have some consensus throughout because it is an objective nature to it. I mean, and the other thing to bear in mind is that a lot of this data that we base our findings on is very old. And we're using laboratory tests that are very old. There, there are much more modern techniques available, not available everywhere, but we're still focusing on colony forming units, looking at what it looks like under the microscope. And technology has moved on. Well, I think that's true because technology will advance. The question is how applicable will be broad spectrum to all the, the nations with things. So interesting points. You can see the obviously controversy that's out there regarding guidelines and what you really call. But it sounds like from the group and the voting, everyone agrees. Symptoms, probably number one, then some objective nature, uh, number two to it. So kind of getting back to the patient at hand, just as a reminder, his symptoms were really vague symptoms. You know, just odor, sediment, cloudy urine. Were they really infections or not? And the tendency that tends to occur is the easy, simple thing to do is to just prescribe an antibiotic. And you can see that pattern just reiterates itself because E. coli just keeps coming back. Is that really asymptomatic bacteria or is that truly an infection? And so what that has prompted us to do with, and our colleagues is actually to look at a model, what are really all the risk factors that are there that go into when the patient comes in for urinary tract infection? And we feel that kind of instead of just handing, you know, getting a culture, giving them an antibiotic, you really should dig a little bit deeper, take a little bit deeper dive and to say, you know, is there something that we can do as providers to really change and prevent this person from getting infections in the future? There are many, many risk factors other than just the catheter or instrumentation. You know, as you go through individually, the general conditions, looking at diabetes, looking at their overall health, we didn't really talk about the female aspect of things regarding postmenopausal females with possible use of estrogen, but various things to look into. The local conditions, whether they're stones within the bladder, whether they've got thick-walled ischemia within the bladder, other things of their technique, educating within that process of, of the proper catheters of using it, and then also education of the patient. These are all factors that really take, as we've said, a holistic approach to really optimize the patient's use. What we've been able to accomplish is become a, a holistic approach. I mean, that's what we all want. We want to use kind of a holistic approach to try to improve the quality of lives within our patients. And I think that's what kind of this forum is setting up. This is what we're starting to do in 
and getting everyone together. And so the next you know, day and a half, we're going to be really focusing in on that. So I'd like to thank my panel for their comments guiding me through this. Thank you.